All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Ross Seamer, the Semiconductor Analyst here at Deutsche Bank, and we're ready to get started with the next presentation at the 2020 Deutsche Bank Technology Conference. We're very pleased to have Forrest Norad, the SVP and GM of the Data Center and Embedded Solutions Group at Advanced Micro Devices. So good morning, Forrest, and thanks for joining us. Before we get started you... diving... Oops, sorry. I said good morning, pleasure to be with you all. Great, great to see you back in the office as well. So before we get uh, into your specific portion of the business in the data center side, I wanted to ask you one other question. Overnight, there were some press reports and speculation that about your semi-custom business. And, and while I realize that's not exactly the topic of the day that we're gonna be addressing here, I wondered if you could comment a little bit about those reports. Well, look, we, you know, as we've commented uh, before, we have a very large ramp coming into the, the second half of the year um, across multiple product lines, really across every business. And, you know, I can't really comment on any specific uh, product or any specific customer, um, but demand continues to be extremely strong and uh, the ramp is going about as, as we expected. Great, Thank, thanks for addressing that in, in general. So why don't we dive a little bit deeper into your business? So the, the data center market and the server CPU market specifically, those have been great growth drivers for AMD over the last couple of years, mainly driven by the Epic traction. So I wanna dive into that a little bit deeper, but before we do that, I've been asking all the companies a few macro related questions, uh, given the interesting year 2020 has turned out to be. So the first topic, and, and we were talking a little bit before the, the cameras turned on here about uh, COVID and being back in the office, et cetera. So how has the, the COVID pandemic, as tragic as it's been, impacted your business? Has there been pull-ins from the work from home and the cloud side of things or pushed out uh, demand because uh, new workloads are having a difficult time launching at a time when everybody's just trying to remove uncertainty? What have been the puts and takes in your business during these uncertain times? Yeah, I think I think uh, generally we see COVID as as a forcing function that's accelerating IT transformation. To be candid, um, you know the the necessity to have everybody, you know, be able to work productively from home is I think you know driving a uh, an increase in <clears throat> an increase in needs for infrastructure. You know, everything from the PC sitting in front of the uh, in, sitting in front of the user at home to the back-end infrastructure, be it the on-premise infrastructure or the cloud infrastructure that's that's obviously connecting all of that and enabling all of that work. Um, so we see that as as probably, you know, as a net positive that I think we've, we've said before. Um, I think from our experience, you know, I, I think I personally, I walked into March 15th of, of 2020, expecting that it would really be a challenge, that, that we would see a hit to productivity, that we would, we would see, um, you know, really slow down in our ability to get things done. Um, I've been very pleased by seeing quite the contrary. I mean, I think uh, if anything, productivity may be slightly up. Um, you know, people are traveling less, uh, people are more available. And we've had, um, even for development of new products, we've had, uh, you know, the, the engineers and the whole team really rise to the occasion, embrace these new tools, embrace the new normal. And uh, I think we've been able to, to maintain a high degree of productivity and keep the products on track. You and I were talking a little bit before, again, the cameras turned on, uh, that the quantifiable side of things, it seems like the productivity is great and no product launches have been delayed on your side or anything like that. How do you think about the, uh, the more qualitative side of things? The, uh, the kind of the uh, moments of inspiration, the serendipity, those sorts of things. Yeah, no, I think you know, that is, again, personally, that's more of a concern. That's my new concern, I guess, is, you know, how, how do we replace the serendipitous moments that occur when you bump into somebody, you know, at work or an engineer leans over the, the, uh, the cubicle wall. I don't know that we've got a perfect answer to that. I mean, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on, to, on, uh, on with, you know, Teams meetings or, or uh, Zoom meetings across uh, teams, even in an informal setting, not necessarily, you know, a scheduled meeting for a particular work topic, but just teams getting together on a regular basis. We see some experimentation there. 
Um, and in, we've, we've also uh, increased the round tables and increased the birds of a feather uh, meetings to try to get some of that serendipity to happen. I think that's something that's going to continue to evolve. Though. So the other dynamic that's made this year interesting is the, the U.S.-China trade tensions. <clears throat> how, have the, how has that impacted your business, if at all, year to date? Yeah. So, look, we're we're uh, we are 100 percent committed to complying with uh, U.S. regulations, and we've taken what we feel are the appropriate steps to ensure that we're managing um, uh, the entity list and our interactions with with customers or potential customers who might be on the entity list <laughs> appropriately. But based on the the licenses that we've been able to uh, secure. Um, we don't expect to see um, a significant impact on our business at this time from uh, from any of those actions. And the license uh, application process and being granted license, is, is that changing with the most recent regulations that I think go into effect this week, yesterday or today? Or uh, when you talk about the licenses that you've been already granted, is, is that uh, inclusive of the most recent restrictions? Yeah, I think, look, I think it is a continuously evolving, uh, uh, continuously evolving situation. And again, we're going to we're going to stay in compliance above and beyond anything else. We're going to stay in compliance with the with the regulations. Um, you know, I think there is a little bit of uncertainty in around exactly what these new restrictions uh, translate into um, from a uh, from a regulatory perspective, detailed regulatory perspective. But I would anticipate that uh, you know we'll continue to be able to have uh, access within the restrictions uh, that we need to service our customers. That's great to hear. So the last macro topic I wanted to bring up before we dive more specifically into the AMD side of the equation is, is kind of the, the health of the cloud computing market in general. Uh, there's big picture debates about uh, has the work from home really just accelerated the the digitization of the economy, like you mentioned, that seems like uh, it's definitely occurred. But there's fears that some of that could also be described as a pull-in of demand, and we could be on the cusp of a, a little bit more of a digestion period like we saw in late 2018 and 2019. So talk a little bit about what's your view on cloud demand and aggregate, and is AMD of the size and with the products that you're launching somewhat immune from that dynamic, regardless of whether you think a digestion period is necessary or not? Well, you know, we're certainly, uh, we certainly saw, first off, back in Q2, we've already said we saw strong cloud demand uh, in Q2. Um, I think that, that again, the, the tailwinds provided by the, the need to lay on additional infrastructure for, for collaboration and work from home, you know, clearly provided uh, some, uh, some tailwind there. Um, but, but, but but again, most of these most of the cloud projects are, are long term projects that that uh, you know you work with to qualify uh, your product at the at the cloud customer over an extended period of time, and then it rolls out accordingly. You know you may see some some acceleration or some additional impetus by things like COVID, but you know I think it's it's from our point of view, um, we're in a shared growth. Uh, perspective. We are, you know, we've, we've got a strong set of products. We've, we've been in a strong shared growth uh, mode here, uh, particularly with the, well, well, not particularly, both on the client side as well as on the, the enterprise side. And so I think from our point of view, we're a little less affected by, you know, the macro market factors and we're more, you know, focused on how do we continue to execute the projects that we've We've uh, we've already won and, and make sure that those deployments go seamlessly. Uh, and then secondly, you know, regardless what happens in the market, we got to get shared. And I think we've got the product and the roadmap to do it. So when you talk about that that share gain dynamic, uh, I want to dive into some of the the technology side of that equation and what's driven that. Obviously, there's a, a, a huge attribution given to the manufacturing node. Uh, not only your success in ramping that, but also uh, your primary competitors' uh, hiccups on that front. But before diving into that, I think that the architectural decisions, the design decisions you've made, don't get enough attention and, and potentially not even enough credit. So talk a little bit about the architectural decisions you've made, you know, multi-core processors, there's a whole bunch of different things you could uh, use, but talk about those decisions and how the architecture 
is driving those share gains as much as the node. Yeah, no, I think that's that's critical. And by the way, they, they interrelate. Uh, they interrelate in a, in a major way, and I'll talk about that in just a second. You know, I, I think that going back, you have to look at the resurgence of AMD as the fruits uh, of, you know, from the seeds that were planted back in really, quite frankly, 2012. When Mark Papermaster and Lisa Sue came in, one of the first things they did in 2012, before Lisa was even CEO, was kick off uh, the, the generation of a new high-performance CPU core engine. So the Zen CPU core roadmap um, is absolutely critical. And that when we introduced it in 2017, it was, you know, it was over a 50% improvement in instructions per clock cycle <laughs> from our the predecessor product. And so that's that's that has nothing to do with the process. That's entirely the architecture and the implementation of the design, independent of clock speed, independent of process. And so I think, you know, we also made the commitment at that time that we were going to maintain a regular cadence of new CPU cores, you know, building a, a high performance roadmap and maintaining, uh, you know, maintaining a, high, a very competitive roadmap for the long haul. Um, we couldn't do it all, we knew, in terms of one generation. So, you know, that first Zen 1 core, um, was uh, was was great and a huge leap forward, but Zen 2 was as well. And, you know, Zen 3, that's at the, the heart of our next generation products, is also a, a tremendous, uh, tremendously uh, powerful architecture and, you know, right on the trajectory that we needed to be on. But then the question came of, okay, so we've got a great engine. How do we put it together? How do we make you know both compelling client chips as well as data center chips? And that's where I think we made a, a quite frankly a brilliant decision. We we created this, uh, and again this predates me, so I'll give all the credit for for the for the core architecture to, to Mark and team. Um, but we created this scalable infinity fabric that allowed us to interconnect CPUs and interconnect. The, uh, the rest of the parts of the design uh, very quickly, very efficiently, very high performance, and completely unlocked the topology of the part. So we no longer had to you know, keep CPU and all the high performance component, components confined to one piece of silicon, a monolithic piece of silicon, and that's hugely important because as you want to add more cores, as you want to add more performance, you, you, if you just keep growing a piece of silicon, you know, it, there's a nonlinear, you know, impact on yield, there's a nonlinear impact on cost. And we couldn't, we, we thought going forward, your customers are going to need so much performance, we need so many cores, we cannot do it with one monolithic piece of silicon. So we developed the chiplet technology and we brought chiplets um, to, the, uh, to both client and enterprise. And chiplets uh, allow us to put a lot more silicon within you know, one part than you could otherwise afford. And they also allow us to access advanced technology nodes faster. So if you take a look at the chiplet, the architecture of our existing products, we use seven nanometer advanced technology uh, for the CPU cores and for our desktop and uh, server products, those CPU core chiplets are pretty small. They're about the same size as a, um, a cell phone chip, which is not a coincidence because that size chip is what's used to bring up and get into high volume production, that new manufacturing node. And so by centering our design around that point, we can optimize yield, we can optimize performance, and we can get into uh, market much faster, get that, that, that advanced manufacturing node out faster uh, and put more of it in a socket than we could otherwise possibly do any other way. And so I think that was hugely important and enabled by that infinity fabric, that infinity architecture that allowed us the freedom to, you know, put together our high performance engines in a variety of ways. That's really helpful detail. And I think people do underestimate the, uh, the, the magic of the infinity fabric and everything else that that's unlocked. So if we just get into the straight node, Moore's law, node war discussion, how are you thinking about the, the advantage? Well, 
If we back up a second, talk about the ramp you've had at seven nanometer to date. And does anything change given your primary competitor's latest hiccup on their manufacturing side? Does that change anything strategically for AMD? Yeah, you know, look, I think it's, uh, we're, we're very focused. Um, we're very focused on, on executing our strategy and running our play. And uh, we always assume that our competitor is going to do extremely well. Our competitors are going to do extremely well. So I never want to assume that they're going to run into a manufacturing or issue or any other issue. Um, and so we put our roadmaps together um, with the best technology that we can possibly get access to and the best architecture that, that our engineers can dream up. Um, when now, because we did that, we could, you know, drive to seven nanometer in a, a very fast way. And, and again, accessing it to begin with, with relatively small chips, just using many of them. And that's driven our migration to seven nanometer, uh, that, it, you know, at a very fast clip, I think it's uh, the fastest ramp we've had on, uh, on a new node. Um, and again, accesses that advanced technology, you know, in a, in a, in a prudent way. You should expect that we're going to continue to, to take that sort of um, approach going forward, ensuring that we've got the architecture and the topology uh, to get us access to, you know, the best possible node at any given point in time. And so I think you, you'll see us be very aggressive. So the last question on the manufacturing side, given you guys raised guidance on your last call, which seems like a long time ago already back in July, uh, yeah. that this year is turning out to be much better than, than feared, uh, how's the supply situation? Do you have sufficient supply to do everything you want to do on the seven nanometer side? Yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, supply is, uh, and I think we've, we've commented, supply is, is uh, sufficient. Um, but, you know, but it's tight and it places a premium on planning for ourselves as well as planning for our customers. Um, but we think we've got the supply chain, you know, lined up from, uh, from wafers to substrates and, you know, everything in between uh, to, uh, to hit uh, our, uh, our guidance. So let's pivot over to the, the server CPU market specifically and some of the market share side of things. Uh, I think AMD deserves a huge congratulations of hitting up to the 10% the or, or double digit market share in the June quarter that you guys had promised. Uh, I know you're not gonna give whatever the new market share target is. I think at the, the last event that I actually physically attended within the industry was your analyst meeting back in early March. Uh, and, and no such number was given at that time. But I did want to just get your thoughts on the market share side of things. It took you about six quarters or a year and a half to go from the five to the 10 percent market share. How do you think the slope of that share gain curve looks going forward? Would you be able to double the share again in the same amount of time? Uh, is it more uh, a much fairer way to look at it that adding the incremental five points of share rather than thinking of it as a doubling would happen over that time? Would it happen faster or slower and why? Yeah, so you know, I think I, I think I, I, I don't want to get into the mode of, of you know, in setting new benchmarks, you know, along the way with with fine granularity. I, I think all we've said about share looking forward is, you know, we certainly aspire uh, over time to exceed our, our historical high water mark, which was you know twenty six, twenty seven percent unit share, and certainly over time, I think we've got the roadmap. Uh, uh, to do so, but uh, but we're not going to put we're not going to put a slope on that line or 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 put further intermediate milestones. What we're focused on though is taking the 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 momentum that we've built with the the ecosystem and our partners and customers uh, with the first generation of of Epic Naples and now the second generation um, and continuing to build on that. So Naples for us, you know, was getting quite frankly, was getting to that first 5%, was getting to um, having people used to AMD back into in the market, was having, uh, you know, customers believe that we could deliver a high performance uh, component, with, that we were doing what we said. And to that end, Rome was hugely important. The second generation Epic processor that we introduced last August 
but it's hugely important, not just because it's a great product and, you know, really with 64 cores offers literally double the performance of, uh, of our principal competitors uh, offerings at, at that point in time, still just about the same. Um, not only, you know, offering literally double the performance, the other critical part of Rome is it's exactly what we said we were going to do. Um, and that predictability of execution gives customers confidence that they can invest in putting AMD into their infrastructure. They can invest in optimizing for AMD microarchitecture and that we're going to be around. Um, and so Milan, along the same lines, Milan is critically important because it's a further demonstration that, um, you know, the roadmap I stood on stage and, uh, you know, in front of, in front of, you know, everybody and, and their brother's uncle in 2017, that, you know, we're delivering three years later, we're delivering, you know, at like a metronome. And that confidence that that we can be trusted, that we, we will do what we say we're gonna do, and you can count on us, coupled with, you know, the high performance that we're offering in Rome and we're gonna build on in Milan, is I think, you know, driving, you know, rapid adoption for us across cloud and enterprise. And, uh, you know, we think we've got, you know, a, a clear, clear path to continue growing this business aggressively. So, yeah, I agree that trust is something that's key in, in delivering the roadmap with the products as promised on time is, is uh, something that uh, all these customers need to see to, to be able to adopt the product. And thankfully, that's exactly what you're doing. You also mentioned about, uh, I'll put it, I'll describe it a little differently than you, but an expansion of the type of customers that you're addressing. Right. The initial ramp to 5%, I think, was largely cloud driven, less of the enterprise side of things. Talk about the broadening of the market that you're addressing. What your customer profile looked like in the first 5% share, what it looks like at 10% share, and how you think it's going to look as you go beyond that level. Yeah, no, look, you're, you're absolutely right. It, when, we, uh, when we went, when we put the roadmap together, uh, you know, you can't, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. You can't re-enter the market, a market like this, you know, with, uh, you know, all at once. And so the, what we tried to do was we took the characteristics of the Zen core, the first Zen quarter that we had, which was a good core. Uh, and it was also very efficient, sort of at lower power levels. So it couldn't necessarily reach the same frequency as our competitors part in a power unconstrained fashion. Uh, but it was more efficient than our competitor's product in a power constrained environment, a high core count environment. That drove our strategy for that initial product to design something that was great at throughput. It was great at, let's, you know, let's, in, in scenarios where you've got 32 cores operating within a power constrained, you know, 200, 225 watt envelope. Um, and uh, it was very efficient, very competitive there. Well, what, what workloads correspond to that? Cloud, you know, cloud workloads, at scale workloads, certain HPC workloads. And so that's, and certain virtualization, private cloud workloads, that's where we saw traction in the first generation. Um, there are also, you know, customers that quite frankly are more, uh, uh, you know, very technically savvy and, and more tolerant perhaps of a little risk. And so that's where we focused Naples, and we said this in introduction, and that's where we had uh, the most uh, most success. With Rome, we opened up. Rome is a much higher performance uh, part, both in terms of it doubles the number of cores. It's it's it uses a seven nanometer uh, process, of course, and it it has the Zen two engine in it that opened up the aperture of the workloads we could uh, compete in from say maybe 50 to 60% in with Naples, those, those cloud workloads, those at scale workloads. With Rome, we designed it to have coverage of say about 80% of the workloads, including many in the enterprise side. Now, as it turns out, th that design point was against where we thought our competitor was going to be. Um, and uh, 
uh, they, they, they weren't quite where we assumed they would be. And so I think the coverage on Rome is even better than we thought. And so many more enterprise workloads um, are, are a great fit on Rome than, than we originally planned for. And so the expansion on Rome has been from, you know, going beyond cloud and certain memory focused HPC to really every HPC workload and almost every enterprise workload in addition to the cloud ones. So seeing a lot of traction there, and we've also put a lot more time into the ISVs that are relevant to the enterprise side. The strategy with Milan uh, was to get, you know, the Zen 3 core and, and Milan out there to really have 100% coverage. No excuses, no, no, um, uh, you know, no, no compromise, really to have leadership performance in virtually every workload from enterprise to cloud, from, you know, new software to find telco and storage, you know, down to IoT gateways. And we think we were on track to achieve that. And we think that's really going to drive uh, the, uh, the, the business going forward. So I think when you see Milan come out, we think we've got complete coverage in the market. So I put that together. It seems like you've built the trust up, doing what you said on time. You're expanding the customer base. Like you said, now Milan has no excuses, talks to, uh, can address all the markets, all the workloads, et cetera. So uh, I'll give you know, one more attempt to maybe put some words in your mouth, but would you be disappointed if the slope of the share gains was slower going forward? It seems like you have two big positives, big tailwinds that, uh, that you didn't have when you were going from zero to five or from five to 10%. So it, it, with those tailwinds there, uh, uh, maybe you just, just smile if you agree. <laughs> well, look, I want to drive this business as hard as we possibly can. We've got a great, great product roadmap to do it. Perfect. So let's talk about the, comp the competition side of things. How does pricing enter this equation? Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the last time when AMD did hit that kind of upper 20s market share. Uh, and the response at that point uh, from your primary competitor was for a period of time to get very aggressive on the pricing side. Uh, and that kind of you know, damaged the market temporarily for both, but really hurt AMD somewhat structurally. There's a thousand things that are different this time but how do you think pricing enters this equation and are you seeing any change in the behavior on that front? Look, you know, I, I think we've always anticipated, you know, there's a lot of scar tissue here at AMD uh, of, you know, competing with, with Intel for many years and they're a fantastic company, um, great competitor. So, you know, we've always expected the environment to be extremely competitive and I would say that it's about what we, about what we expect. But the thing to, to keep in mind about the data center market is, you know, and I, I've said this a number of times, it's all about performance. You know, the, the, the one way to think about it is the CPU is about, say, 25% of the cost of the system, 20, 25% of the cost of the system. But unlike its power, you've got to wrap sheet metal power supplies, motherboards, network adapters, memory, storage, et cetera, around it. And, um, and so, if you think about it from that point of view, a, a simple way, a simple way to think about it is, if if your performance, given that the, the cost of the component is 25% of the cost of the system, if your performance is, say, 75% of the competitors, you could give your part away and it doesn't matter. You know, you still can't win the total cost of ownership at the system level. So for us, the principal focus is all about performance. How do we deliver compelling performance that translates into system level TCO um, you know, for the end customer? Because that's what the informed customer is, is, going, to, is going to do, is, is going to ma make their buying decision on the basis of that, that system level TCO, which is only very weakly correlated to the price of the, the CPU component. So, you know, that's our focus. And I think we've, we've architected, now I will say one other thing that we've, again, architected the solution, you know, with the, with the chiplet approach to be far more cost effective uh, than perhaps following, you know, a monolithic roadmap with, you know, very large chips to reach the upper ends of, of, uh, of the performance spectrum. And so I, I, I think we're in, we're seeing about what we expected. 
our focus is on the system level TCO, and I think we've got the performance to to win uh, those fights. And we've you know we've I think very thoughtfully architected our solution to be cost effective. So the other competitive dynamic I wanted to hit on was more ARM based uh, CPUs in the server market. It, it, Long been rumored as a viable threat against x86 and aggregate. Uh, you guys, back in time, even dabbled a little bit of, of some of the heterogeneity that, that ARM might be able to bring to it. Recently, some of the hyperscale cloud guys are doing some internal efforts on that front. And then, obviously, as of yesterday or the day before, you also have the turbocharging of the server CPU uh, on the ARM side as part of NVIDIA's logic in uh, attempting to buy ARM itself. So how do you view the competitive threat either internally or from merchant silicon providers from ARM-based CPUs in the server market? Well, look, I, I think, you know, you know, first off, I think we've always said that our, our, our focus is on high-performance high CPUs and GPUs and offering a compelling competing, you know, a compelling uh, competitive roadmap. Um, and again, reference my comment of a, of a moment ago, I think that the performance is the critical thing. If, if, you've got a high, if you've got a high performance solution, you're going to win the, the TCO uh, battle at the system level. So maintaining that high performance roadmap is, is critically important. You know, secondarily, there is the issue, of course, of, of migrating workloads from one instruction set architecture to another. I would maintain that generally that hasn't happened. Um, if you take a look at the, the history of the computing industry, it's very difficult to displace a uh, computing architecture unless you have a new workload coming in. Um, because the, the thing that is theoretically the most fungible in the data center, the software, is, is actually the thing that's the most adamant. It's, it's hardest to, to change, it's slowest to change. And so for existing workloads, it's a huge barrier uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to somebody migrating over to a new instruction set architecture. You know, that said, look, I think there is, there is and there has been for a decade, you know, interest in ARM in the data center. Um, I think that, you know, we see a, a lot of tire kicking. We've seen it for a decade. Um, and, you know, different companies will make their own independent decisions. Our focus is make sure that we are always providing, you know, extremely high performance, the most competitive uh, performant uh, CPU cores and increasingly GPU and the combination together. Um, and, uh, and I think that so long as we're doing that, we've got a great, a great, uh, you know, a great competitive environment ahead of us, and we expect to see x86 is still the dominant instruction set architecture in the court. So we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to hit on a topic you just mentioned about the partnership between the CPU and the GPU. Obviously, GPUs as accelerators have been a, a huge market. Uh, your biggest competitor on that side has grown that market from a couple hundred million dollars to multiple billions of dollars per year in business. Talk about AMD's aspirations in that market, and, and when do you think that can be a needle mover within your company as a whole? Yeah, no, I think I think uh, you know we definitely see uh, GPUs as a as a critical driver of growth in the data center, um, you know, for us going forward, and we we've, we've thought that way for a while. We've just tried to be very thoughtful about look, you know, we're we're oh, yeah. You know, any company has to make resource decisions, and I'd much rather do a you know a great job at a few things than a crappy job at one thing too many. Um, but that said, I think we've been very thoughtful in preparing for uh, GPUs being a bigger part of our data center portfolio for some time. We when we think about GPUs in the data center, we really think about it in in, in three different uh, primary areas. Um, one is essentially VDI, um, or you know. Uh, remote rendering, rendering in the, the data center, be it for cloud gaming or be it for a desktop or workstation a replacement. Um, we think that's, a, that's an important growth area uh, for us. We, we're, we're pleased and proud to be part of several major cloud gaming uh, initiatives. We're pleased and proud to be part of you know, some great uh, cloud BDI offerings as well on the productivity side. And given COVID, we expect to see quite a bit more of that 
well, not just COVID. COVID and its after effect of, you know, uh, you know, what I've heard people refer to as the next normal of, you know, increased work from home, no matter what, um, we expect to see that VDI uh, uh, interest in market continue to grow. The second piece is really traditional HPC, traditional high performance computing for scientific research, for medical research, you know, for product design. Uh, and then lastly, of course, uh, and, and certainly far from last in terms of importance, you know, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, machine learning. We see all three of those as being, uh, you know, critical growth drivers for us going forward. With all of them, the software is the key aspect. Um, and so, you know, we focus on a couple of things. First off, uh, there's there's no point in trying to duplicate what my competitor has done. You know, trying to run run and catch up, uh, running their exact same play is a, is a fool's errand. And so, what we've done is we've really worked to um, uh, partner with others on development of an open source uh, software framework for or software frameworks for both uh, machine intelligence uh, 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 and HPC. Uh, and so our Rockham stack, for example, you know, Radeon Open Compute uh, is, a, is a critical part that allows uh, our customers and us to innovate together and to, you know, to drive, um, you know, drive some pretty compelling solutions. The second piece of this is, you know, accelerators for HPC or machine intelligence are still hard to use. And so part of it is, you know, continuing to work on the frameworks, continuing to make it easier for developers to embrace this technology. But the other key part that we've talked about that's really led to our exascale wins um, was adding coherency so that the CPU and the GPUs, instead of being apart, connected by, you know, a, a, a thin IO link, are connected via high performance coherent interconnect where very importantly for the software developer they no longer have to explicitly manage the pool of memory down on the accelerator be it a gpu or anything else um, we think that's a huge disruption and it unlocks a lot of additional accelerator capabilities it makes it much easier to program and uh, I think that was key to uh, our exascale wins. So putting those things together, you know, we're, we're very confident in, in, uh, in growing that market quite a bit. Great. Well, Forrest, time went really fast on us. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, it's great chatting with you on this. Congratulations about the great growth in your business. And we look forward to monitoring it going forward, whatever the slope may be. So uh, everybody, that will end this presentation. Thanks again, Forrest. Thanks a lot, appreciate it.